What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. And yo, the week is here. That's right. The week. Listen, this week, straight up, this week, our whole website is relaunching. The whole platform, everything is changing. So if you're listening to this, you got about mm, less than a day to make sure you're signed up for our relaunch. Make sure you're paying attention that you're tapped in, that you're looped in, that you're plugged in, that you're phoned in, that you don't phone it in, you know what I'm saying? That you're not leaning out, that you're leaning in, what's up? Um, To make sure that you're just like really checking out and making sure that you're ready for this new experience that we're gonna be delivering through our website. That is of course very functional and smooth and easy to use on our phone. So just make sure you're checking it out. I'm gonna continue to plug live in corporate um, the fact of the matter is like our content is evergreen and so you know there's people we look at our data and we see if there's people who go back and listen to podcasts from like a year ago and so we're trying to do something new where we essentially make it easy accessible and frankly automatic for you to like engage content that we might have recorded several months ago bring it right to you push it to you make sure that you know um that there's really good conversations out there that you just may have missed. Or if you're new to live in corporate as a network, you just maybe even never knew about it. Right. So I'm excited about this. I'm excited about Wednesday. And if you listen to this on Tuesday, that's tomorrow. But it's a really big day. Really, 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 really big season. Um, and later this week, I'm going to be shouting out um, the brands that were launching with us because we also launched. That's right. A job board. You know, a lot of folks who listen to us are uh, black and brown folks in the STEM space. We already know we always looking for jobs because of the way that white supremacy is set up. So I'm really excited that we're going to have a centralized resource where a lot of the people that you're going to hear, a lot of these VPs of talent acquisition and diversity, equity, inclusion and chief operating officers and CEOs. A lot of those brands are going to also start posting opportunities from their companies on our job board. Right. I'm excited about that like that really energizes me straight up. So I want y'all to know that um, I care about the audience that we have. I care about the fact that like y'all trust us so much to listen to us day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out for the past few years. And I want to make sure that we don't just stay being an audience. I want us to really grow and evolve into a community and having a space that has bespoke content curated just for you having super dope jobs from brands that we trust and that we believe are doing the work to create equitable, inclusive places to work. Like that is important for us. And it, for us, it's a signal that living corporate continues to grow and like mature as a brand. Um, you should know that there's going to be brands that reach out to us and want to post on our job board that we're probably not going to say yes to because we know they don't really care about black and brown people. Right. So you should take it that if there are brands working with us and they're posting jobs on their job board, that we're having real frank conversations to make sure that they're making intentional steps to create equitable, inclusive and psychologically safe places to work. And I'm going to tell you straight up, like <laughs> if brands come on and they post some jobs and they say that they say the stuff and everything. And then we find out later, hey, actually, like I took that job and it wasn't the best job. It wasn't working like, you know, that reflects badly on us. Right. So we care. Right. We want to make sure that, you know, the people that we work with work with reflect our mission and our vision, our vision and our values. So, again, excited. I'm excited and thankful. Continue to be in this space. When y'all heard me say that the past couple of months, it's because this has been going on in the works for a while. We're finally at a place where we're launching. And so um, huge deal and completely bootstrapped. Right. So shout out to the entire living corporate team. Like we were able to do this without any type of VC support or crazy loans or whatever. This mug just came from us building, working and driving and building the capital on our own and like I can't emphasize enough like how proud I am of this team because 
this team came together to create this whole network of content. This team has come together to interview incredible guests. This team has come together to write incredible pieces of thought leadership. Like this team did that. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't just the Zach Nunn show. You know what I mean? It was a team. It's been a team effort. And we're now launching into something new because of the team. So shout out to the team. Um, and look, man, shout out to our, our guest, um, Jason Thompson, who's the vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion for Western Governors University. Um, he's an author. He's a speaker. He's a he's a he's a charismatic guy. Like, and I really appreciated our discussion today uh, that you're going to check out after we tap in with Tristan. So we'll see you in a little bit. What's going on, Living Corporate? It's Tristan, and I want to thank you for tapping back in with me as I provide some tips and advice for professionals. Today, let's dive into three lies you're telling yourself that are holding you back from growing in your career. The first lie is if you keep your head down and work hard, everything will work out. While hard work is necessary, that is only one piece of the puzzle when it comes to career advancement. You have to proactively build the right relationships, know how to market your skills and accomplishments, and learn how to advocate for yourself and ask for what you want. You can't just passively sit by hoping someone will notice your greatness. That can only lead to frustration after being overlooked multiple times. You have to take control of your narrative and career or someone else will. The second lie is that your background has to align perfectly to secure your next position. How many times have you read through a job description and you threw in the towel when you got to that one bullet point that disqualifies you? Believe me, I've been there. But believe it or not, job descriptions are not the end-all be-all. In fact, they are simply a wish list of all the things a company believes would make an ideal candidate for the job. Instead of giving up, take the time to reflect on your experiences, skills, and abilities to identify how they align with what you want to do. This will help you convey your value to the potential employer. I always suggest throwing your hat in the ring as long as you meet at least 60% of the criteria in the description. The third lie is that asking for help is a sign of weakness. Woo, do many of us have this bad? Asking for help does not mean you are incapable or even bothersome. If we're keeping it 100, the more successful you become, the more help you're going to need to get to that next level. It is incredibly important that we not only build, but actually take advantage of our network of support. In doing so, we don't feel as alone, and we can often fill in the gaps or achieve our goals much quicker. In recognizing these myths for what they are, you can move past some of your career progression roadblocks and achieve your goals faster. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume, or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. Jason, welcome to the show. How you doing? I'm well, I'm well. Thanks for having me. Hey, first of all, it's a pleasure, okay? Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about, just to start, is how you how you got to the role that you are at Western Governors University, You're the VP of of DEI. How does that how does that come about in like an academic institution and setting? Like what what was that journey like? Yeah, you know it's interesting because I've been doing diversity almost thirty years. Um, shows my age, and my first job out of college was actually diversity, and um, her name was Dr. Dolores Cardona, and I always say she saved me and raised me because um, I was. I, I had literally just flunked out of college, barely got myself back in. And for somehow she found me and uh, just kind of took me under wing and, and started just felt I had some potential. And without her, you know, I wouldn't have graduated. I probably wouldn't have started my career in diversity. Somehow she just believed in me and spent a lot of time with me to help me uh, learn because I'm also dyslexic. And so the first couple of emails I sent when after because I graduated, somehow I graduate, you know, with this inability really to write. And then I wrote this email, which was terrible. And then she sat down with me and, and just said, look, from now on, everything goes to me first. And she would edit and give it back to me, edit and give it back. And then I slowly, my writing improved. Um, and it, to this day, I, I'm thankful for her because I wouldn't have been here. And, um, but that's how I started my career in diversity. And then from there, you know, I worked at University of Wyoming, of all places. And, um, and that's where I met her and that's where I graduated from. And then you know, I worked at the US Olympic Committee 
um, a healthcare system. I've been at Techstars, now Western Governors, and a kind of a niche of just launching diversity programs that um, over the last 15 years, that's pretty much what I've been doing. So, Well, first of all, that's that's beautiful. Um, and it's just interesting. I think we undercut, we undercut, under we underestimate or underappreciate um, the value, just a little bit of gentleness, right? Like, yeah, exactly. you know, that, that amount of care just to, just to slow down and be like, Hey, let me help you. Like, yeah, that's exactly. a, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. And just all the opportunities mm-hmm. that that created without it even being like the main part of the story, but it's like, yeah. had that not happened, yeah. you know, where would, where, like, would we be sitting here having this conversation today? All exactly. the people that you touched and were able to impact because so it's, I, I find that, that kind of made me tear up on, on the inside. Not only I'm, I'm tough. Is it, but, yeah. <laughs> no, well, you know, honestly, it brings me to tears sometimes too because I look back on it because you know, make it, you're making a good point. There's a connection we often forget is the gift she gave me has also been given to my children, right? Because I had better opportunities. They go to college without the worries that I had. You know, they never had to worry about making the bills or, or any of that. When, when I went to college, you know, my parents gave me 20 bucks. That was it. You know, and I was on my own. And I remember just the fear of knowing, man, if it, if it goes bad. Matter of fact, my last three years of college, my parents didn't have a phone. That's how poor we were. So we didn't call home. My brother joined the Navy and left. I remember I didn't talk to him for two or three years. I think people forget, like, that's what poverty looks like. But because she held on to me and helped me graduate, it just broke the cycle right there, right? All of a sudden, my kids go to college pretty much carefree. They don't have to worry about financial aid. They don't have to worry about, you know, it's not that I'm rich, but it just creates a whole new different experience for them, you know? No, you have, yeah, it's just a different level of access. Um, so you know, let, let's talk about let's. I want to get right to this book, right? So you know, um, diversity and inclusion matters. Um, you know, tactics and tools to inspire equity and game changer performance. Like the first of all, uh, I, the book design, like the cover, like how did this come about? Oh yeah, so this is uh, you, you'll see. If nothing else, I like to think of myself as a good dad. And and uh, what happened was, you know, I, I never read a book before, and so this publisher, you know, they they approached me. I write the book, and then they say, um, "What do you want on the cover?" And for some reason, it never dawned on me to think about what to put on the cover. And so they said, "Well, go to the bookstore and take a few photos," which I did, and I submitted those. But I also happened to walk by a photo we had on the wall. My son won an art contest. He was like a fourth grader. So I take my iPhone and I literally took a picture of this because we had framed it. You know, he's a fourth grader. You win the art contest. Yeah. And so I frame it and I just happened to include it. And as soon as they saw it, they said, that's incredible. Who's the artist? You should use that. And I was like, yeah, that's my son. He was a fourth grader. And so that's how the cover came about. And it's it's touching because he's dyslexic. I'm dyslexic. And, you know, to have that just unique intersection, being actually writing a book and having that on the cover was just, you know, pretty emotional for all of us, as you can imagine. So. That is, man, that is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, and I, you know, like, we didn't, we didn't, you know, I didn't send you questions beforehand. So yeah. that really caught me off guard. That's, that's a beautiful yeah. story. Damn. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, okay. Well, well Jason, um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, like the context of the book and just a little bit about what we talk about this whole idea, this gap between pledges, uh, mm-hmm. corporate pledges and action. You know, there's this couple of articles have dropped, you know, murder mm-hmm. George Floyd spurred a bunch of people making, yeah. um, I, you know, I call them like their headline grabbing pledges, yeah, exactly. but they're not yeah. really like, but when you kind of like ask like three more questions, it's like, okay, but what do y'all really, you know? So like Walmart, yeah, exactly. or like, they'd be like these multi-billion dollar companies. They're like, oh, we're going to pledge $20 million over like 20 years. And it's like, oh, I mean, okay. Yeah, cool. Exactly. Right. Um, yeah. let's talk a little bit. Of, let's talk a little bit about that though. Like this what, what what would you what would you say what, how would you account for the dissonance in the pledges themselves and the tangible actions that were coming about two years later like wh- yeah. what would you what would you account that to well you know I wrote the book partly because what we see is a lot of people think oh we should hire a diverse officer but there's no real good training. Like a lot of it is very theoretical and it wasn't very practical. And kind of what you're touching on, I, and I talk about this in the book, is like audio should match visual. Like a lot of companies have said all the pledges, but then you look at their website and you look at their leadership team, you see you no know, people of color, you see you no know, women, you know, just the diversity isn't there. And uh, part of it was like, what are the practical things we should be doing? And that's collecting our data, analyzing it and creating our plans based on it. And that's kind of what I, the book's very practical. You know, I just try to point out these are the things we should be doing on a regular basis as an organization so that audio matches visual. Like if you make a pledge, where's the proof? And to me, the pledge is the easy part. What I'd like to see is who's getting promoted in your organization. You know, how long do people stay? What does that leadership team look like? 
and um, to give diversity officers the resources to be successful. Because I think part of the challenge is not only there's lack of training, you're not really fully resourced. And so if you don't mm-hmm. even have a resource, and so the book even talks about like, if you don't have resources, this is the things I would be doing. This is how I try to overcome some of these things. Because I think um, it, it's like insult to injury, really. You're set up because the company makes this place and they go hire a diversity officer, under-resource you. And then there isn't a great a lot of books and things. Most of it's theoretical. And so no wonder people struggle. No, no wonder most people don't last as diversity officers. You know, it's interesting you say that, like this whole this, this space around theoretical, like this the reality of like just how most of these frames and ideas are theoretical. Like, you know, something I was talking to somebody um, who's also a, um, they're, they're, a, they're a DEI leader at their organization. And there was a report that came out and it was talking about how, um, really talking about anti-racism, right? And, this, and so, and um, and someone said, hey, you know, give me your, like, we have, like, we have a chat and we we're talking about anti-racism. And, and I was like, you know, it's interesting. Like I read the report and like these things sound like how they're, how they're framing anti-racism and, or how we're really going to make sure we talk about anti-racism or like the importance of it, why anti-racism is important. And like, it was all very educational content. And I walked away feeling good, but like, I also am, you know, I'm, I'm I'm coming from a DEI consultant and DEI executive background. So like I'm asking myself, okay. And I was HR business partner. So like I'm asking myself, okay, operationally, like what does anti-racism really mean? Like, 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 and like when you say, when you use words like anti-racist and justice specifically, I, I like, I think about, okay, so there's probably some type of um, reparation that needs to happen or some type of power redistribution or, um, some like complete overhauling of employee policy and process and like probably some new like performance management system that's probably going to be a bit more critical on certain behaviors. And, you know, like there's a bunch of things, right, that like I associate with though there's a bunch of operational things that I associate with those with that language. But what I but but I agree with you that like so often um, we're we're given like. Um, what's the word like, like kind of the lexicon kind of updates and so we're given new words to say but we're not really given anything to like operationalize those words you know what i mean yeah exactly because i think that's part of the gap too is like as an employee what do you want me to do like i know i go i go to the mandatory training but what am i supposed to do when i get back to my desk and you know here's an example i use all the time and and a lot of times when I do, when I'm on a panel and they ask me like, what's your final thing or whatever, I tell people, this is what I want everyone to do, at least as a minimum. We know women and people of color have been, have been historically underpaid, right? And generally when you have a new position and you hire someone, they give you this pay range, right? And it says you can pay them between, you know, I don't know, let's say 80 and a hundred thousand. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll turn around and say, well, what kind of salary would you want? And we don't tell them what the range is. And if they say 70, we pay them 70 and we act like, well, that's fair without realizing historically people of color have been underpaid. So if you ask me what I want, I'll probably underestimate because I've been historically underpaid. But for the individual as a manager, I don't think they realize that that's how you perpetuate institutionalized racism and privilege is by just simply paying people the minimum perpetuates its history. And the way you become anti-racist is to say, no, I just as a practice always pay at the highest range. Because if we do that individually, we would actually close the pay gap. If we looked at women and said, you know what, I just pay women the top of the pay range, no matter what, it actually will start to self-correct because that's one thing we could do individually. And I think you're right. Like if we just call that uh, anti-racism, like, well, yeah, I want to be anti-racist, but what am I supposed to do? It means when you get back to your desk, this is a simple practice that actually is perpetuating racism and you have to do nothing. You can just show up every day and I just pay people on the middle of the range. Like even if we just said, oh, we, I don't know, I always pay middle of the range. It's still disproportionately puts people and women of color at the low end. And then if you think about it, you look at policies like um, everyone gets a standard 3% raise. Well, if you think about it, people of color who are typically pay, underpaid in the beginning, women, that 3% for the rest of their career in your organization is basically perpetuating this. Instead of looking at it and saying, no, is this fair and this equitable? This 3% is actually not fair because if I started lesser and you have a history of paying people of color and women under less than their peers, all it does is perpetuate that existing inequity and that's what we see that's why we see this stubborn number that never changes and how women and people of color are paid is because those kind of policies perpetuate it that's how you become anti-racist is you look at that and go okay no i'm not going to do it that way i'm going to make sure that what we have is equity so you know you know i, I also recognize again like your illustrious career 
nearly 30 years. You've been in this space. You've talked to a lot of different leaders. I'm going to ask you a question straight up. Is HR the problem? Uh, yeah, it is part of the problem. Okay. You know, because I, I think I always say two things to be true at the same time, right? It could be the solution and the problem at the same time. And then many times uh, the process and policies that just reproduce like, oh, everybody gets a 3% raise. That sounds fair, but it, it perpetuates inequity. Or when you do find, and we have this all the time, right? Oh, we found that uh, systemically people of color in our organization are underpaid, but we ain't got enough budget for it right now, right? We, 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 you know, and then we, we slow work this solution. But the reality is, in some cases, you have to have this uncomfortable conversation about what are we doing to perpetuate this and making people uncomfortable. And a lot of times we facilitate leaders who, who are problematic. We keep working around them, hoping, well, they're a good leader. We're trying to help them. And sometimes you got to go, no, no. We got to make a tough call here and people got to go, right? And so that's that's been one of my realities too many times is um, if you're always trying to protect the organization, you are failing the organization. Like sometimes it's not protection. You, you need to do the right thing. It's tough, right? Like, I, I, cause look, I, I fully believe HR is a problem. Like I've said that several times on here and other platforms. But, I, but to your point, like the last profound, like, you know, the, the whole, I, I think the, the function of HR is to protect the business, right? So they're never going to, I mean, now you may have like your more junior HR professionals. They're going to, they, they'll be a little bit more vocal and stuff. But again, like they're tamped down by the true executive HR leadership around that type, you know, in terms of like, okay, well, we're not going to really admit that we were wrong. We're not going to you know, try to right size anything. We're going to just, we're going to continue to play defense, right? We're going to, we're, you know, sh- like we're going to, we're going to Philly shell. We're going to, we're going to be careful. Um, so talk to me though, about you, 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 and I, I don't disagree with you, but I want, I'd like to hear you unpack a little bit more of if you're protecting the company all the time, you're not protecting the company. What does it look like to quote unquote, not protect the company to help the company? Yeah. So, well, this is the thing. Like, I've never been a fan of this term belonging, right? And and and, uh, and this is the story I'll tell, right? Because that's what the logic becomes. You belong to our organization or you don't. And the other thing I have a problem is you don't own me, right? So I don't belong to you anyway. But to me, that framing, even of how we think about it, oh, if you belong, that means we have to have this agreement that you won't question me either. That's how you belong, right? We got to get along here. Mm. And it starts creating this culture that reproduces itself in a way that in many times is discriminatory. So I think what happens sometimes is because you belong, we can't have some in the world that says we're, that we've made a mistake or something's bad. And so what companies start doing is they start protecting it. And a good example is I worked in the Olympics, right? And I'm not trying to, to badmouth it, but we know what happened with our gymnasts, right? And in the end, you could see people start making these individual decisions like, well, that looks bad on the organization. We shouldn't get the word out. Instead of saying, this looks horrible when we need to address and do the right thing. And doing the right thing actually protects the organization. Because you see, now they had this long, horrible history that if someone immediately, the minute they heard, if they'd have done the right thing in that moment, it, it would have changed the whole trajectory. But what they did is like, we, they thought anyway, I'm protecting the organization. If this word gets out, it would be bad on the organization. Instead of saying, no, we're going to out wrong and always do that, it would have actually been the right thing to do. And it would have protected the organization. You know, when you talk about like you, you talked about at the beginning of this conversation and, and just, you know, I recognize your background, DEI programs like just, you know, I, I have this I have this like push about I have a rub about like DEI programs that so often in my experience, not only like as like just a person who would participate in, in them before I really form like really like really fully got into DEI as a consultant and then as a as an executive so so often it feels like theater Jason like it feels like okay we're gonna have a panel we're gonna we're gonna trauma bond over our experiences as insert marginalized group we're gonna pay twenty thirty thousand dollars for the speaker um and then you know we're gonna you know say a few buzzworthy thing buzzy things and then we're gonna kind of get back to work like Talk to me about like what advice do you have and like or that you've provided or even your own point of view on connecting um, DEI programs to true organizational impact and change. Yeah, and that's a huge part of the book. Um, we, we have a little startup and in the book you read have this thing called CAPE. 
and it's collect, analyze, plan, execute. And what I found is most organizations start with a plan instead of saying, no, 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 you should start by collecting the data. So then you know why you're building this plan and then you can hold everyone accountable. So you can say, look, there are certain levers within the organization that everybody controls. Who gets promoted? Who gets hired? How long they stay? And if you start managing those things and holding people accountable, because to me, that's when you, when you have to look at a department and say, hey, you know what? Um, you made 30 hires last year and you only hired one person of color. That to me looks like some form of discrimination. I can hold you accountable to that, right? But if, and what I usually see is we do something like, oh, it doesn't look very diverse in the department. Maybe we should have a training, right? Maybe we should talk about this. And to me, that's the frustration because that doesn't actually produce anything. Like we, it, like a conversation, you should actually show up and go, here's the data. And I'm going to just, have, I need to hold you accountable to this data because, and it brings us full circle. This, uh, this conversation about audio has to match visual. You keep saying you're committed to diversity, but I'm not seeing it. And so the goal of the book is how do we connect those dots? Like you got to collect this data, hold people accountable. And out of fairness, sometimes it's like, look, you're not very diverse, but you never had a chance to hire anybody. And I talk about this in the book too. A lot of times you say, oh, look, if you're committed to diversity, your leadership team should be diverse. True. But the leadership team is the slowest one to turn over. So the real thing is, what did you do when you had a chance to make a hire? So if you only made one hire, what did that look like? And what was the process to make that hire? And then at least as an organization, you can say, look, you know what? We do everything we can to keep good people. And when we're good at it, people don't leave. So our diversity actually will be somewhat limited in that. But the reality is, what can I do when I get to create the opportunity? So it's like, okay, when you do hire, what does it look like? Do you have a process to try to find diverse candidates? Are they being promoted within your organization? There's actually a lot of things that can be done. And so I think if we move away from, and I think that's a lot of times people have done like presentations and panels, it's because the leadership team never gets more diverse and they can't explain it. So we got to do something. And so it becomes this theater. Oh, we care. So we're going to do some performance, right? We're going we're gonna to put on this thing. And I'm like, no, actually you, you should be able to explain if it looks like it does two years in a row, if you have a logical explanation, people can accept that. And if you say, but this is the strategy, or if you say, look, we know we're not diverse, but we also have influence over the community. So we're trying to build a pipeline in the community. You know, right? there's a lot of things you can do to say, I'm trying to change our trajectory. If I can't change everything in this moment, what's the trajectory we've set for our organization and how are we going to get there? And it's not to be little panels because I'm on a lot of panels, but you're right. Like it's becomes diversity theater. And, and uh, it's, it's frustrating because it looks the same every way and you, you just keep having me show up and talk about things. You know, it's, it's interesting. You know, we talk a little bit about, um, and I was just, I just had this conversation like literally uh, earlier this week. We were talking, I was talking to someone about this program that they had to bring on um, black and brown interns, right, to the organization and, and really help diversify to hopefully eventually diversify leadership. And, you know, my response to that person at that time and my response to like, to any of these programs that are like kind of focused on that one. A lot of times when you think about some of these programs that we call D and I programs or I and D pro, whatever you want to call them, they, they, they give off the, the, it smacks of um, paternalism. Like let's help these ignorant black and Brown people because they clearly need help. We'll help them assimilate. And then we'll just kind of pat them on the back and maybe they can blossom into a leader um, at an organization. So one, I, I'm curious, like, have you, my first question is, have you sensed that? And then, then the second question I have is like, or the second thing about that, about the whole idea of like internships and like, like um, uh, for, for black and brown folks or targets to black and brown people or entry level programs for black and brown people is um, so often these organizations don't have a culture that would um, invite retention of this talent. And so like one, I'm curious to get your perspective on um, just the overall sentiment and attitude around these programs in general. And then two, I'd like to get your perspective on what organizations need to do to create environments that actually drive retention as opposed to just recruitment. So that we're not having a revolving door of black and brown folks. Yeah. And um, I stopped doing these like developmental programs because it means you always see people of color as not ready. And as a result, it actually becomes more preventative because if they haven't finished the program, it's like, well, I can't hire them yet. They haven't finished the program. But my white peers don't have to do that. Like there's no developmental program for my white peers to become CEOs. But for people of color, we always, that's our default. But you're right. The mindset of that means you look at communities of color as less than and that they need to be fixed. 
instead of saying, these are my peers. So what we've been doing is we create networks because actually that's how you get the CEO job or any other senior job is, is networks. So we've made things that are informal, formal, the implicit, explicit, because that's actually where it's broken is that typically people of color are not systematically part of that system. And then what they do is create this other system where you always appear as less than and act like that's equity. And it's not. Actually, what I need is access to the network because that's where the jobs are happening. Like we got to make that point of it real. Um, I've been spending a lot of times telling my my peers of color, like, look, if, if a headhunter calls you, take the call and go through the interview. It doesn't matter if you want the job. But many of us have come, like my parents never had a headhunter call them. They don't know how the system works. And so as a result, um, we're outside of this network for some of the most senior positions because they, they come through headhunters. And if we always say no and think about it in the context of, well, I don't know if I want that job instead of thinking about it. No, I just want to be in that network. Like if I go through the process, even if I say no and it didn't go well, the headhunter knows who I am. Like there's a process of getting executive positions. And it's interesting how we've been systematically removed from it. And then even when it's presented to us, we say no, because we don't know historically that that's kind of how this whole process plays out. Right. And so that's where we need access is actually the network. And somebody telling you, no, no, no. <laughs> Take those interviews, make your network and, and realize like the, these in these events, like the things we fame many times. Go, oh, that's brown nosing or whatever. Like, no, actually, that's how the system works. And you got to learn how to play it. And many times people are, well, I'm not going to sell, sell out of what I'm like. You know, this is our reality. This is how the, the game is played. And um, if we continue to, act, to, to self actually select out of these systems, it's the reason those positions don't are, are rarely offered to us, number one. So some of it is our own work we have to do. But the second piece is we have to call out these systems, which is what you pointed out, right? A system that perpetuates the fact that I'm always less than it, it is never going to see you as a senior leader because every, you've always got to be fixed. So we got to call out like that. That's actually not what the solution is. We, you, we got to get into these networks. Now, organizations need to do inclusion work too as well. And so I would agree with you like that. And I think some of that is policy and some of that is actually the network. If I can have casual conversations and call out your behavior, some that's actually where some of the problems I see. Like everyone knows what to say formally. Like no one's going to say they're racist. But because we don't network informally, a lot of times that informal education that you need and how you see me and calling out things never happens because we've actually systematically segregated ourselves. And then the only time you see me is when you show up to the pipeline program. So then it's, oh, I have to see you as less than never as a peer who questions my behavior. Whew, goodness gracious. Um, let me ask you this, because you, you said something and it, it, it got something for me. So I'm going to ask you this and, I'm, and we, can, we can wrap up. Um, you know, you talked a little, you talk about selling out and the, the concept of like, I'm trying to, I feel like, like, and I've brought this up before on like other conversations on living corporate and outside of it, frankly, but this DEI space um, is challenged. It's challenged by the fact that there are folks, uh, there are a variety of different players and actors on the stage, right? So you have some folks who come in this on one side of the spectrum, and I would say very much so like an activist and almost like abolitionist lens. Like, so they're taking, they're looking to adopt um, activist practice uh, and uh, methodologies and language and points of view from um, black liberationists, uh, black American points of view and things of that nature, or just at perspectives from the black diaspora. Um, and they're talking again, like I would say folks would call them quote unquote radical. And I will say like they're the far left. And then I think on the far right, you have like this, like assimilationist type perspective around DEI that really focuses, that leverages inclusion and belonging as tools of, um, uh, to create more homogeneous environments to really kind of absorb into whiteness. Um, you have um, like a, 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 a desire to kind of stay away more from difference and focus on sameness, a desire to kind of shoo away from race and gender and just kind of talk or talk to, to shoo away from race and really just talk about gender, like kind of centering white women in the work. Um, and, and I see this, like, I, I you know, I, I see this landscape and then you have people all, all across that spectrum, right? Somewhere between that left and that far left and that far right. And I'm, I'm curious, like, what are you seeing in this landscape? Like, do you, are you seeing similar things? And then two, do you believe that this industry, as we look at the political landscape, um, as we look at just like all the confluence of things that are happening right now, do you see this being a viable space for real change in the next decade? 
The short answer is yes, and I'll tell you why. Partly because um, we have to get into the C-suite and it's the door that's been opened to us. Sometimes you gotta walk through the door you've been given, right? And I always say, um, if you're in a capitalist society, act like a capitalist. And we live in a capitalist society. So the reality is um, it would be great. Honestly, you probably have more influence if you're the COO than you do have the chief diverse officer. But let's be honest, the only door that's been opened to me in the C-suite at this point is the chief diverse officer. So when you get in that room, you have to use that leverage to try to transition to other places and actually impact the organization. And I think we, as people of color, have a right to all the above. We are diverse. And some people have a conservative view. That's their right. And they have a right to exist. And some people have little, they have a right to exist too. And I think we have to start validating all the above. And I think the opportunity that we have is this. And I kind of alluded to it, but my, my logic now has changed over the years. And I feel like we should make as much money as we can. And then you create a foundation. Because if you think about it, all the major foundations in the US that have tons of money, that's how they did it. They made the money first. And for people of color, and I know why we do this, it makes sense because we care. We work in nonprofits and foundations because we're trying to change the community. And it actually hasn't produced that well. It's not been great. What we think conversely should encourage people, make as much money as you can. And when we make that money, create a foundation and make change. Look at the Ford Foundation. Tons of money in it. They made the money first, right? And we need to give ourselves permission. Like if we could actually impact our community, just look, I'm not selling, just make as much money as you can. But don't forget where you came from and create a foundation. Actually, we see this strategy has actually worked in the U.S. We've done the opposite. We like oh, do as much as we can in a nonprofit. And I'm not saying that those things are bad. I'm just saying we should think a little bit different. Like you live in a capitalist society, be a capitalist, you know, and actually encourage that behavior. Because I think if, you know, with Jay-Z, I mean, they make tons of money, right? He could create the foundation and, and his legacy will last forever. See? And if you think about it, that's what Ford did. Every major foundation started that way. We should give ourselves permission to do the same thing. Like. Here's a strategy. We should encourage this behavior, do well, you know, get the money and then create your foundation, make, make the change, like create a legacy. And I think that's our opportunity, actually. Like, you know, some people got to come in through the diversity door. You get in the door, you learn the company. Don't forget where you came from and, and make changes where you, where you can. You know, Jason, before you know, we before we got on the um, on the pod, you know, as we talked about experience and age, that's how it's that's like that's how so. That, that that just smacks of like maturity. Like that's that's like the common sense wisdom that's like, I really appreciate that. I really do. Um because there are certain realities that we have to engage in, like we have to just re- embrace in the context of this system. So I appreciate that. Um listen, the book, the book is called Diversity and Inclusion Matters, Tactics and Tools to Inspire Equity and Game Change in Performance. Jason, um, we're really thankful uh, for you being a guest on the show. If you haven't checked out Jason's book, take the time, look in the show notes, click the link, check it out. Incredible book. Um, It's very approachable for a variety of different angles. If you're a leader, if you're someone, just another employee, if you are, um, you know, an aspiring ally, if it's uh, it talks a lot, really practical advice and really engages in Again, this distance between um, audio and visual. Jason, look, um, you're a friend of the show. Look forward to having you back. Um, let's let's have you back in between your next book now. Like, like don't be a stranger. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'd love to come back, and I appreciate all the kindness today, for sure. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care, man. And we're back. Listen, um, I want y'all to understand something. Living Corp is going to continue to have extremely frank conversations about the experiences of historically marginalized people at work. Like, we're not going nowhere. Y'all going to see this website. and It's going to look like somebody slapped a bunch of money on this thing as if, like, we got funded by some, you know, whatever. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, Do not let the slickness of our website fool you. Do not let how again like crispy and fire everything and like the production and all that stuff fool you you know we're keeping it a hundred around here right so if if you're not here to have authentic conversations and be uncomfortable to speak to the realities of these systems that continue to oppress exploit um, and crush us for financial gain don't come around here for real like just don't come because i'm not gonna entertain having conversations with brands 
a lot of these brands want to come on for the free anyway. You know what I mean? They want to come on just for the look, acting like they're doing me a favor to say a bunch of pre-recorded lines that don't even really make sense when I look at like their headlines. You know what I mean? So we're not going to do that. So if you're coming on Living Corporate, you need to be ready to have an authentic conversation. If you want to do some marketing stuff where you just plug how great your organization is and how you've never experienced racism or how, you know, your leaders are doing the great work and everyone wants to work here. You want to say all that kind of stuff. You need to do that on your own platform. Work with HR. Go to LinkedIn. Go to Sherm National. I'm sure they'll pop you up real nice over there. But over here, over here. We have in real talk in the corporate world. The world is on fire right now. I'm not going to sit right here in front like stuff is sweet because it ain't. You know what I mean? So, again, shout out to the entire team. Um, I appreciate everyone who's been listening. I appreciate the um, the five star reviews. I appreciate the shares on LinkedIn. <laughs> I appreciate uh, the follows on social media. And look, I appreciate um, those who've already been signing up, like to subscribe to our newsletter, right? Like I appreciate everybody and it's going to continue to take a community, a coalition of different people, uh, different backgrounds and different perspectives and different experiences to really push this work forward. And again, this work is centering and amplifying black and brown people at work, black and brown, gay, black and brown, straight, black and brown, disabled, black and brown, first generation, black and brown, black and brown people at work. All right. Till next time, y'all, this has been Zach. Listen to Living Corporate. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.